Welcome to System Design Fight Club. Today we are going to be solving the distributed linked list problem. Uh, it's taken from somebody's real Google uh, System Design interview experience. Um, we did manage to get some nice scale problems for this number. Um, there was a couple of things that were left ambiguous that would have been really awesome to clear up, but the scale numbers on their own are uh, super helpful. Um, so it's going to be a distributed uh, doubly linked list, um, and it's going to have about 100,000 QPS for reads and writes. Um, so that's more than one machine can handle. Um, and then uh, they also specify that it's 1 billion nodes, um, which is um, the interviewer explicitly said that it will not be enough to fit on a single machine. And so um, it's uh, too much uh, data to store on one machine, and it's also too much reads and writes to hit store on one machine, which means we can't do a one liter approach where uh, we just scale it up with a whole bunch of read replicas. Um, so between those two requirements, if it, if we didn't have the 100,000 reads and writes and it was able to fit on, actually if it was 100,000 reads and writes, but the storage was not uh, a limiting factor, as in it was able to fit it all on one node, you could definitely handle this just off of the uh, leader follower pattern. And then it would just be like super, super straightforward on solving it. Um, but that is unfortunately not the case. Um, so again, the numbers, 100,000 QPS for reads and writes, uh, billions of nodes. Um, I'm assuming that the value for the actual node is going to be an int, and we're not going to try and generalize it to any kind of object. I think it's actually not that challenging to figure that out. Um, I don't think that would be too crazy to figure out, um, but I just want to keep things simple, and I don't want to... Um, focus on on that part because the scale part's much, much more interesting here. Um, so uh, the things that were left ambiguous that I wish that we did actually have numbers on, for were um, whether we had a celebrity problem for the distribution of the rights. So for example, uh, for the doubly linked list, are they primarily going to be appending on the ends of the list? Or are they also going to have some that are like right uh, throughout like the middle of it? Are they going to be like evenly distributed across all of the list? Or are they just going to be like on the, the very top and the bottom of it? Well, I can go ahead and like maybe have a little um, demo of what I mean is that we're going to have, uh, this is our list. I'm going to draw it really quick. And it's going to be billions of nodes long. And so I thought that the reads and writes, the, the inserts would maybe be focused here naturally because, you know, otherwise they're going to have to do a, uh, a full like scan down tons of records. And so uh, that actually adds the conversation is that there would maybe be, um, you might wanna speed up the reads by doing these batched key range reads or something. Um, but anyways, that's the two variations is, hey, uh, you know, are we gonna have the celebrity issue? Um, which would mean that we also have to think about um, right conflicts. It's, it's uh, where do I have notes on that? Yeah, okay, so when it's right on the ends, that means that there's tons of writes focused on one specific little record, and then you're gonna have very heavy write conflicts. Well, if it's not focused on the ends, if you have billions of records and you have, um, we can actually do some quick math on that, is that if we have um, 1 billion records and we have um, 100K, uh, we'll say 100K writes, uh, how often is each node in particular gonna be getting touched? is that um, you just divide 1 billion by 100,000 and that would be the, the, the frequency between uh, writes that interact with one specific record. And it's gonna come out to, um, it's uh, so we have 1,000. 1,000. Divide by, oh, it's, I think it's 10,000. Yeah, I think it's about 10K seconds. Um, between uh, rights touching the same. Um, but I mean, when you're doing the transaction, you're going to touch the one before it and the one after it. So it'd be maybe closer to about um, 5K seconds. Um, but still, that's that's a pretty large amount. It's minutes between touches to the same record. And so you don't really have to, like you, you can totally just scale it up, uh, have each node as a, uh, like each each record has a dedicated leader, and you you would be totally just fine. Um, so it's it's a you can just kind of do like a sharded PostgreSQL thing, and you'd be able to handle that pretty easily. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different approaches of the schema. Um, maybe don't need to focus on that. We can we can maybe talk about that a little bit later. 
um, we can talk about the high level design approach and start going through this. And then this is going to come up a little bit more when you get down that list of high level design approaches. Um, any questions before we keep going, though? All right, I can't see any of the questions on YouTube, unfortunately. Um, so I'm just watching the chat and it does in a Zoom and it looks like I don't see anything over there. Okay, so we're going to keep going. Um, so for uh, my first approach, there's actually a CRDT for lists. There is. It's actually used for Google Docs. Uh, so they treat um, a document in Google Docs as a single list, um, just one big, great, big, gigantic list. Um, but uh, the issue here is that we have billions of nodes, and they had explicitly said that one node, uh, it's, it's, um, we're not going to be able to fit the entire list on uh, one machine. And so uh, I don't think the CRDT is actually going to be able to handle this. Um, I, don't, I don't think the CRDT would be able to handle this um, specifically because uh, it's supposed to be too large for a single node. And um, I don't know if the CRDT is, it, it, it's, um, CRDTs are supposed to be kind of like an eventually consistent convergent data structure. Um, and so all the data for the entire thing within the CRDT record is supposed to be replicated in its entirety across all the machines. So it's not a viable approach because you'd have to be able to fit the entire linked list on every single machine. So um, this is this is also a, a similar reason to, it, it's similar to the, um, why the leader follower pattern on its own was ruled out is that um, that would have also been viable if we were able to fit the entire data structure on one node. So the second idea was coming from the gaming leaderboard approach from Alex Hsu's second book, which is where we're going to use a Redis sorted set. And um, this is still totally viable for variation one. Um, variation two, it's going to rule out, it's, it would get ruled out. We can go ahead and draw it though, is that... Uh, so we have the browser, or it's just like the, the client that's going to be interacting with our service. Um, and then we're going to have our backend service, and it is going to be uh, our uh, list um, access service. Um, and it'll be horizontally scaled out, of course. Um, and it'll interact with some kind of distributed database. And in our case, we're going to use the, uh, the trick used from gaming leaderboard. And so you're going to have um, Redis sorted sets, which are a skip, which are a skip list. And um, so you have this like sharded skip list. Let's move this out of the way. I'm going to move it up here. The diagram will, of course, be available on Discord afterwards. And um, so you would have basically uh, records um, one through uh, one million. And then you have records. Uh, records uh, 1 million through 10 through uh, 2 million and et cetera after that. Um, I'll stop after this one and you guys will probably get the point is um, that you would figure out what uh, which of the node shards that you wanted to insert it into and then you would be able to put it in there. And um, the tr what was so special about the sorted set trick was that it keeps everything in a order and you're able to look up a specific number. So this would actually also really help with, um, I was talking about trying to speed up those reads and to find your position within the list. And so this would actually be um, constant time. It would be constant time for figuring out which shard you're gonna find. And then it would actually be a log of in um, time for finding it within that uh, data store which is the same access time as a B tree, um, but uh, it's, it's able to maintain that ordering without, uh, a B tree is not able to maintain that ordering and that log of an insert. So that's why that would be a really special approach here is that uh, you could, you could do, do these shards that have the full ordering for really fast lookup and a really fast insert. Um, so that's the Redis approach. And uh, you can just go ahead and finish this out with some arrows. And it's, um, I can just go ahead and label it Redis sorted set. Then I can move on to approach three, which will be about, um, oh, we're gonna do transactions there. Yeah, so then this is when I'm gonna talk about the two different schemas. 
So I'll finish this out and then we can start talking about the schemas. I see a question in the chat. I'll get to that here in a second. Okay, uh, is it a write heavy or read heavy? I'm gonna post these into the Sublime text file for people to review afterwards again. Add some little notes at the end. Um, and we also have, is it sorted based on insertion time? So uh, fairness is where that's gonna come up, uh, is, is that uh, that's an open question. I should maybe have a thing tracking open questions. Uh, we'll stick it over here. Just call it uh, open questions. Uh, celebrity issue to the distribution of rights was one and then it's also fairness of insertions because you can't you can't um if you're just going straight off of wall clock time um each of these are going to have a little bit of clock drift and so that raises the question of, of fairness and that's that's the whole reason why spanner uses um the atomic clocks for the true time api is that then you can actually rely on those clocks they're actually they, they actually do use a physical wall clock is, is how you kind of explain it, but they synchronize all of them with um, cesium, I believe, cesium, uh, some kind of atomic element. Um, and so then they don't have to worry about their wall clocks being a little bit off, but we do. And so then you would maybe have them not actually getting inserted in the proper order. They're gonna be off by up to uh, 100 milliseconds, I believe is how the, the most extreme cases of clock drift you would traditionally see under like network congestion on like an AWS servers, you can, it's usually within a few milliseconds, but it can go all the way up to a, a hundred millisecond spike on a really bad network congestion. So uh, um, I, I was trying to look into um, how, what the fairness requirement is for the SEC. I was really interested in that sometime a week or two ago, because it's like, if you can meet the SEC requirement for fairness on the execution ordering for uh, orders placed on the stock market and what they consider fair, they do reorder your orders for market orders so that they can get a couple of pennies off of it. Uh, Robinhood sells their order flow to Citadel, which of course reorders it for, for really nice profit margins. But it's like, if you can meet the fairness requirement that the SEC places on them, I'm sure it's good enough for our use case um, because I don't think the client's gonna know. Um, Okay, anyways, I got a Redis sorted set thing here. I, oh, questions, right. Okay, is it write heavy or read heavy? They didn't specify, they didn't specify. Um, and so I'm assuming the worst case where our writes are of course going to be um, so heavy that uh, you would have to worry about write conflicts. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm, I'm assuming that it's it's heavy enough that you would need to worry about write conflicts when it's not evenly distributed. You have to worry about that celebrity issue. Um, so, uh, that was left open and I should maybe stick that over into, uh, open questions too. Uh, that is definitely a good one. And I am assuming it's even. And then, uh, I'm, I'm assuming 100 K each, which keeps it interesting. Um, if you can come up with anything very, well, so if it is, if it is read heavy, if it's read heavy, you can just go, that would just look similar to my, um, variation one. Um, so when I was talking about the celebrity issue, that's why I have, uh, variation one and two up here is that, uh, when, when it's, um, not heavily on the ends and it's evenly distributed across all of them, you can treat it similarly to if there's actually a low write volume, because again, you're not going to be having write conflicts. It's um, so here you're gonna have to worry about write conflicts. Um, you can maybe even split this off like. And that's why I did that math on how far apart those write operations would typically hit the same record is that would determine whether or not you actually have to worry about write conflicts. And uh, so under variation two, you definitely would have to worry about write conflicts with what I was assuming. Uh, is sorted based on insertion time. Yes. Okay. So this is where fairness comes into play. Um, so, and uh, so what am I actually doing though? Um, so I actually kind of have, uh, so there's, there's a couple of different ways to, it. it is by time. Yes. I'm assuming that if you are doing an append to front, 
if you're doing a pen straight to the front, um, I'm assuming there's two different kinds of pens. One is where you just you specify a position, which is where you're able to uh, insert right into the middle of it, and then you don't really care. But if you're doing a pen to front, then yes. So like uh, in um, in uh, Java, there's like add front, and then there's also versus like add at like position 123,700 or something. Um, what is it? Uh, comma. Uh, so it looks like a little bit like this or uh, what would get us that even distribution is that you would have things that look like this or delete that versus add front. And then the add front is um, this one is based on, this one's going to be on insertion time. And so uh, I was getting towards approach three. Oh, got another question. Uh, can you have a distributed hash table with consistent hashing kind of strategy? Um, I remember you talking about this a couple of times where you brought up the cord white paper and that's why I, ex I explicitly put it there. I was never very clear on um stores a subset of the nodes that are doubly linked list uh well so it's it's already so for this this approach just with redis that is um each each one is a leader for a set of nodes so here would be the first one through one million records and etc all the way down to one billion um and then uh hp node stores yeah um and then uh, for the schemas though, I was also considering this other approach where you just have, you don't keep track of next and previous within that. You can just use straight up the Lamport timestamp for doing total ordering. And then you would just figure out who's next by doing some kind of key range query off of this attribute. And so that would be, you can literally just stick your, you, you just hash it to whichever node. So they're just getting evenly distributed across all the nodes as they're coming in. Um, and that's going to be in like approach. Uh, oh, that is an approach three. Yeah, so that is an approach three. So uh, we sh I should maybe split this into two. So one of them is with transactions and then the other one is with the Lamport timestamps. So the first one is um, this one is the Lamport timestamp schema approach. This is uh, through the two different schemas that I had at the top. Um, so this one is this one would have issues with variation two. Is that then you're doing um, you're actually doing um, what's the word pessimistic locking for the transactions or something it's uh you just can't get away with that with variation two uh okay i have more comments in the chat can you what is it how come lamport over vector clock i might be mixing these up i might be mixing this up um so it's you're able to do so lamport timestamps Oh, it was it was a hybrid clock approach, not not Lamport timestamps. It was it was a vector clock or hybrid clock approach, where you're doing um, you're combining your you need a monotonic clock on each of these, and then you're going to combine it with you would still get collisions, you would still get time collisions even with your monotonic clock that's doing nanoseconds. You'd probably still get collisions, and so then you would need to do um, you need to add the uh, Lamport uh, timestamps trick where you have, um, you still are able to order it across those conflicts by using the node ID. So you order it first by the timestamp and then by the, uh, the node ID. Uh, yeah, uh, so I think it's hybrid clock is what I'm describing. I, I didn't actually, that's, that's actually a technical term, but it's, um, I want um, monotonic clock plus Lamport timestamp to resolve uh, timestamp collisions. Yeah. 
Okay, now we can go ahead and uh, any other questions before I try to start on approach three here? Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So we got approach two up here. Um, and then um, approach 3.1, I can go ahead and copy paste these down because they do actually correspond directly to approach 3.1 and 3.2. So this one's going to be the, the hybrid clock thing that I was talking about. I am going to explain that a little bit more properly to those that aren't super on the uh, ball with um, the um, causal consistency stuff. Okay, I've got another question. I do um, want to handle it. I'm maybe going to start drawing the next diagram, though, first. Sorry about that. So here, you still got this. And I mean, it still is going to look the same way. And then it's... um. I think you can just do manually sharded uh, PostgreSQL. It's probably how you can do it. Um, PostgreSQL shard. So it still is going to look similar. In fact, I think it actually would look basically the same as the, the first one, except you've got this um, schema thing that I'm doing. And um, so for the transactions approach, you would have um, that. I hate the text that I've currently got on this. I'm gonna fix that really quick. There we go, that's a little bit more legible. Okay, I'm gonna answer the next question while you guys can go ahead and look at this and try and figure it out. Um, To avoid conflicts, is it possible to use proof of work like block? Oh, like, well, um, so I was actually curious about this. I, so Bitcoin still only handles like 10 transactions per second. And um, when you're waiting for, it can take like minutes for a transaction to go through. Um, so I'm kind of considering something a little bit similar to how it's, it's made async, I, I have more of an async approach with approach five, where I have a command queue where you just stick it all in and then your read even becomes asynchronous and actually gets a result like a minute later. Uh, this is basically the difference between total ordering and total order broadcast, um, which I had brought up last week. Um, I was very curious about whether blockchain actually does uh more of a um the low number of transactions due to the high difficulty of mine well so you don't want to slow it down it's it's kind of a it's it's a mandate to have 100,000 operations per second you you have to handle um you have to handle the scale that was required uh where in the heck did i have the actual scale numbers here it is um, so that's, that's a requirement. We, we can't dodge that. Um, so I, it's imagine if, um, yeah, that's how, that's what the blockchain does is that if you are getting more transactions per second, than what it's meant for, it actually cranks up the difficulty to slow it down. Um, but I still was wondering, isn't it still considered eventual consistency on, on the blockchain? It's, it still has to like propagate to all the other nodes. So I was curious if you have one guy who goes to one vendor and he's got $10 and he spends, you know, $8 at that vendor. And then he goes next door and he spends another $8 there. Um, I heard there's some coffee stores like in uh, San Francisco or so that actually allow you to pay for coffee with Bitcoin. Um, at least that was like 10 years ago or something when Anthony Bourdain was doing a thing on using Bitcoin, like for real life and just living entirely off of Bitcoin transactions for a whole week is that he would like go to these cafes that actually took um, Bitcoin as payments. And so he would go to a coffee shop and he paid for a little bit of coffee with, with um, his, his um, Bitcoin uh, wallet. And so I was like, well, what if he goes there and then he goes next, you know, like down the street and then, um, you know, they might not necessarily be hitting the same servers. I don't know if they'll actually be able to, uh, what, if, what if you do those two transactions at one coffee shop and another before 
um, your transaction propagates? Because I, I was like, isn't it isn't it eventually consistent? Would you actually be able to do something like that on on uh, Bitcoin? Um, so I I was meaning to look into that for a while, but I don't know, and that would actually be an issue. Um, so it would it would still not necessarily um, it would not necessarily avoid conflicts. And um, so this this brings us the concept of um, database constraints like how to actually enforce them. They usually require coordination. Um, if they're if you're enforcing them in real time, it requires coordination, but you're able to get around it if you're just doing total ordering, which is, um, so if, if it's okay for, if, if you're not doing real time, that's when you're able to do the async approach that I had here. It depends on if it's real time or not. Um, so there's that, uh, yeah. Um, it has to be able to handle this volume of QPS though. That's, that's like a hard requirement. Um, Bitcoin is actually really interesting though. I actually do want to read the white paper on that. It actually does look academic. I don't want to go on about cryptocurrency like Ethereum or, or any of those other ones because they're, some of them will write a white paper, but then they talk about the team and all this other stuff and it's vaporware. And so they're not actually interesting, but like, I truly believe that the original uh, Bitcoin white paper was made before any type of hype about any kind of cryptocurrency. It looks inspired by Cassandra because they had stuff about Merkle trees in there. So it actually is a very interesting white paper that I think would actually be interesting like in the academic world. Um, but here, I don't know if you can actually do anything with it. I, I don't think it would actually work. Uh, interesting question though. Yeah, I've been meaning to look into whether it's eventually consistent or not. I don't know if it can actually enforce uh, constraints um, particularly real-time, particularly real-time enforcement of constraints. I don't think it can do. And that was uh, that was another open question is whether the, the constraint is real-time or not. Um, yeah, so I need to write that. Are the reads giving real-time results? You obviously can't lock the head and the, the tail of this distributed list and like you're like okay I see what that head currently is i'm going to append in front of that one so like you're going to get like um i'll go ahead and draw that so uh one of the issues here is like you know you do a read of the head you go here and you're like give me like what's the current head you get the result back and then you, you're like, okay, now I want to write to it. And so then you, again, you do the write over like this because you want to append to that head. Are we really going to have it locked that entire time for two round trips? That would be, you know, if it's hitting, if it's coming from clients that are in like North Dakota and you got like another one in New York City, you know, you're going to have round trips that are like a very bare minimum of 100 milliseconds. Like even if it's like a gigabit internet connection, which is um, 10 TPS, and um, we want to handle 10,000 TPS. And so it's like, we, we can't lock it between the read and the write to append the head if you're going to have them all on the, that, that's that's at least for variation two. At least for variation two, you'd not be able to lock it for this long. Um, even under variation one, it was still like, what did we say, like 10,000 seconds? That's actually not too bad. You might actually be able to walk, uh, do a pessimistic walk like that if you're going to do that. That's interesting. Okay, I wish I thought more about that. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to write a lot of approaches for that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, let's go back. Three point one. Okay, so you would have these records, and you have next, and you have previous, and so like let's say you wanted to do a mid chain insertion, you've got this uh, even distribution across the nodes, and so you got this current record that looks currently got these two right in the middle, and they look like this. So this one's going to be current, and then you've got previous for this guy is going to be that one, and then your next one is going to be F, 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 dash, uh, 999, F, 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 and you want to insert between these two. So you would lock both of those records, and then you would insert your new record right here. And you would need to lock um, the previous and the next one, because you're going to update their values for previous and uh, their, their values for next and um, previous, of course. And um, so then you would 
Okay, I can even do that really quick is uh, that. And so you do a transaction. Um, and then, so that's of course an issue is that now you have to lock those other two nodes while you can circumvent that under approach two where you don't have previous and next and you're able to figure it out off that key range query. And so you no longer have to that pessimistic locking for your, your um, insertions. You can just go ahead and do it live and then it just gets ordered there. That would be an issue though for um, when you're doing uh, mid-chain insertion. This only helps to figure it out for when you're appending on the ends all the way for add front, add last. Well, um, if you're just ordering by the timestamps for by, by this thing and you're trying to insert in the middle, well, then it would not actually be in that proper order um, for the, the middle of the chain. Um, so that's, that's a issue. Um, so this would maybe be assuming that you do not have um, a uh, add middle operation or something. So um, it's, it's an interesting, I, I'm going to go ahead and include it anyways, just because it resolves the issue for variation two, just very, it clearly is onto something there with variation two. And so that's why I'm going to keep it anyways. Um, so yeah, we got 3.1 over here. And now we're going to talk about 3.2, the other variation where you have the Lamport timestamps. So this is from uh, causal consistency is um, where I've, I've kind of seen it come up in uh, the context of is, is uh, Lamport timestamps. Well, so I'm not doing Lamport timestamps. I'm doing a um, hybrid clock timestamp. I'm pretty sure this is how you would do a hybrid clock. You, there was actually no material on DDIA on hybrid clocks. It was um, a little bit surprising. I saw references, maybe it was like briefly referenced there. I didn't find a lot of stuff about it though in any of my books actually. I have like, um, I mean, I didn't go through the SRE book yet, but in um, Understanding Distributed Systems, DDIA and Database Internals, it didn't really talk about hybrid clocks. And um, I'm pretty sure that's what I would want here is that I would go ahead and go off the monotonic clock, which still get drift. And then you would just do the Lamport timestamp trick to resolve conflicts on that timestamp right there. Um, but then uh, um, that would of course mean that you would be losing out on fairness. So this has a, this has a disadvantage of um, fairness, uh, which I should write over here. Uh, But again, when you have requests coming from a guy in North Dakota on dial-up versus guy in New York City on a gigabit internet connection, you you know it's it's like they're going to hit the one guy's going to take you know maybe a couple of seconds to hit the server while the other guy is maybe going to hit it in a hundred a couple hundred milliseconds, and so it's like how much do you really want to consider fairness of the distance over here? How much do you really care about this? when this can have a variation of multiple seconds due to a guy being on dial-up. I don't think it really matters that much. And I think that's really why the SEC can say like, hey, go ahead and reorder it by, you know, 100 milliseconds or something. I, I want to look into the exact requirements of fairness by the SEC, but I'm, I'm fairly certain you can at least make the orders like rearranged in a certain amount of time. So there's at least some extent of reordering allowed by the SEC. Uh, how much I don't know, but it, that's my justification for why um, this hybrid clock approach that has a little bit of clock drift, drift just kind of thrown out the window is justifiable. Um, so uh, you would be able to figure it out just through a, a key range query is that you, you get like the 10th, um, the, the you do um, the offset clause and you would, you would be doing scatter gather for the reads, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, you'd, you'd be doing scatter gather for the reads. Um, that's kind of an issue. So it scales up on the rights, but then your reads are then going to be scatter gather. Um, if you're doing that here, no, actually it is going to be a, even if you're just looking for an individual record, it would be an issue. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But it, it scales up the rights, which was why I really was fascinated with this approach, but I guess, um, it's this one is the the least grounded in reality um, among these two approaches. This one is actually viable. It, it can't handle variation two, but it, it figures out. Um, it definitely works for variation one, and it has a lot more of the 
little details figured out. Well, this one would handle variations whose rights, but it clearly doesn't have a lot of other aspects that are figured out. Okay, any other questions with what I've got so far before I try and move on to variation four? Okay, I'm also going to go ahead and label these really quick is that this one is approach two. Um, and then we had uh, 3.1 is over here. And then we got um, 3.2 is over here. And now I'll move on to approach four. Um, our stream, oh, so this is when I'm, okay. So now we've got the client and this. I don't think you, so I was, I was thinking about like conceptually our, um, our streams a linked list. I mean, you, you append them and they do a total order broadcast internally, which is why they're, they're interesting. Um, but we could also maybe have, um, it, it has, it has a consistent ordering within each shard. It's totally ordered and, um, causally ordered within each shard of the, um, of the stream. Um, and each stream I think can handle like 10,000 writes per second. Um, 10K, it's able to handle, let's say it's going to be sharded. I'm, I'm fairly certain it's going to need to be sharded. It's, it's like right on the edge of, of um, what you can handle for writes off of um, one shard of Kafka. Um, these, these are the, these are the um, specifications for the kind of traffic that Kafka can handle. Um, so in this approach, you'd have that. And then you also have um, this Kafka thing that you have it writing to. And then you have this consumer that's going to pull off of Kafka. And then when you do your read off of that, it's just, you, you read it at 1,000, um, was it 10,000? I thought it was like 1,000 messages per read. Maybe not. Okay, so you read off these big blocks of messages at up to um, 10,000 messages per read and five reads per second. And then you're just gonna have your task runner go ahead and say like, yep, that is one piece of the list. And then you just have those lists as you just string them together after you stick them on the DB, but can like pre um, link all the notes to each other that are getting written. Um, so this thing would pull off of Kafka. It looks kind of like that. And then you go ahead and write these pre-concatenated lists in batch to your shards. And then you, whoops. So you're gonna do like a batch read of like hundred records to um, over here, um, to over, or I, oh, I guess you could have them straight to just, you could keep them like in that order, like where you have the head and the tail that have the celebrity issue, but you're bringing down the number of hits per second by a factor of um, 10,000. Yeah, you're bringing down the factor by 10,000. So it's gonna turn into um, 10 TPS for the writes. So if it was originally 100,000, you're doing these batch reads of 10,000. You're gonna bring it all the way down to 10 TPS. I can go ahead and write that is um, 100K TPS of writes. And then we would only be seeing um, 10 TPS of writes over here, but those writes are gonna be um, uh, these big long things of um, 10,000 records at a time. So still kind of interesting, but um, there might be a way to have each one hitting the different shards, but it's like, I don't know how to, um, how to handle the uh, locality thing. You could also maybe have it figure out. Uh, okay. There's, I, I know there's some kind of trick you can do for like pre batching them all up into these pre made lists. And then it's kind of open on how you're going to do the partitioning strategy, I guess. 
Um, you can't, we don't want to do the Lamport strategy. Um, so this would be going off of this schema for approach four. Yeah. Okay. And then the reads are still straightforward. You just would still have um do uh whoops. This over here. And so then when you're doing a read. The data flow just looks kind of like this. And so that is approach four. Okay, any questions before we move on to approach five? Okay, we're gonna do this. Um, so this one is still kind of going in the same approach as approach four, where we have this, it's going to be a stream of commands though. And so then when the task runner receives it, it's going to um, do the reads and writes asynchronously. You would still maybe want to do um, something that looks like this, um, or it would, it would solve some kind of issue with how uh, you'd, you'd be able to keep things linearized on Kafka. And then though, um, so when you have a read, it's okay. So you have this thing, it has that stream of the read and write commands. It's pulling those off. And then the writes can still get sent directly to the um, shards of it. But then when it gets the read, so it's totally ordered within a shard. And so then when you do the write, you're still gonna have something that looks kind of like that, but then for the read, um, so you would then have, uh, you'd have a, a read command come in, you do your read, and then you can go ahead and send, you'd have a WebSocket open if you're doing the read. And so you do that, it gets the command, you do your read, and then it sends it right to the list access server service that has the WebSocket open, and then it can go ahead and send the read result back over there. Um, so again, this solution is a little bit less thought out. I think 3.1 was my most thought out solution, um, but that was one of my other ideas is the, the um, async uh, queue of reads and writes. Um, and again, I was, I was putting this off for like a few weeks and I thought, you know what, I just need to go ahead and get something out there for that. And we've got like at least, um, at least a few different solid approaches. I have like six or seven in total. They're not all fully baked out, but at least a few of them are pretty well baked. Um, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. Are there any other questions before we go ahead and end the, uh, live discussion? All right, cool. I'll let you guys go then. I'll, of course, post this to uh, the Discord channel, um, the diagram and the text file. Um, you guys are free to go. And then if you have any other questions later, feel free to post them on the Discord and I'll, uh, I'll get back to them. Uh, thanks for joining. See ya.